if you have feedback for us, please send it to feedback at shmoocon.org. We want to hear what anybody has, good, bad, indifferent about what we do. We do read everything that you, you send us, so please, if you have comments, send them to us. Um, nearly $15,000 has been collected in t-shirts for charities, so you can still take home you can still take home our bags of crap, other t-shirts. They are at registration. And are the bags of crap gone? Fine. So there are also a few items in Lost and Found. They are at registration. Stop by. Let us know if you have lost anything. I have a couple of things to give away here. A Shmukon Labs t-shirt that I'm going to throw as far as I can. And <laughs> and a moose multi-tool that if I throw will no doubt decapitate someone, so I'm going to put it here. <laughs> you could do that. Um, all right, so are we, are we good, AV? All right, so I would like to introduce Jeremy Gilula, who's from the EFF, who's going to tell us how they are going to help encrypt the entire net. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, all right, so let's get started. So uh, I'm uh, the Tech Projects Director at the EFF. Uh, now some of you may be thinking, what EFF, Tech Projects, what? Uh, because for a lot of people, the EFF looks like this. These are some of our lawyers. Uh, they're standing at the United States Court of Appeal. Uh, the lady in the center there uh, is Corinne McSherry. She's our legal director, a really, really, really brilliant lawyer. Uh, I don't think they're all EFF lawyers. Some of them are cooperating attorneys. Uh, but EFF is more than just this. We do more than just fight in the courts. Uh, we also fight, or at least talk to, the government in other ways. Uh, we petition the government during the FCC rulemaking about net neutrality, actually all of them so far. Uh, we have submitted comments to the FCC in the latest one. We explained to the FCC why the way they described how the internet works has nothing to do with how the internet actually works and their basis for reclassifying uh, broadband was totally wrong. Uh, but that's still sort of a legal thing. Uh, we also do activism. Uh, these are some of our uh, rallies that we've done. We have activists who sort of generate grassroots support. Uh, and then uh, the thing that's sort of nearest and dearest to my heart, though, is that we also code. And this comes as a surprise to some people. Uh, but we actually have quite a few software projects that we have software developers at EFF writing. Uh, there's our, I mean, if you want to go to GitHub, you can check us out there. These are a few of our software projects or at least the, uh, the uh, logos for them. We've got Privacy Badger and HBS Everywhere, uh, a couple of browser extensions we develop, as well as CertBot. And it's these last two, HTTPS Everywhere and CertBot, that I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about today. So, so really EFF has three fundamental theories of change. We've got lawyers, legal, activism, and technology. And it's this last one that I wanna talk to you about today, and in particular, how we've used technology to try and undermine mass surveillance. Uh, and, of course, that translates, as you'll see, into encrypting the entire web. So, to do that, let's take a little trip down memory lane. We have to go back uh, about 10 years, actually even longer, to 2006. So, back in 2006, a guy named Mark Klein, uh, who was a former AT&T technician, came to EFF. He literally, like, walked in our door uh, at, while we were uh, at our Shotwell offices. This was way before my time and told us about how AT&T was happily uh, providing the NSA access to basically their backbone and letting them split off the fiber optic signal so they could copy everything. Uh, basically facilitating the NSA's warrantless surveillance of Americans' uh, communications. And so we're like, well, that's no good. Uh, we're EFF. That, that sounds bad to us. We should do something about that. Uh, and so we tried the courts. We, you know, this was our first... Uh, theory of change, and this is sort of EFS original theory of change, is the legal system. So in 2006, uh, we sued AT&T in a case called Hefting versus AT&T. Um, uh, Congress responded by passing a bill that basically gave the telecoms immunity uh, from, for helping the NSA. So we're like, okay, fine, we can't sue the telcos because Congress wrote a law, that sucks, but we can still sue the NSA. Uh, so in 2009, that's what we did in another case called Juul versus NSA. Um, that case is still going. Uh, and so the, whoever said that the wheels of justice grind on slowly uh, wasn't 
uh, uh, overestimating. It's been 10 years and it's still going. And that's how, that's how the legal system works sometimes. Um, so the, the legal theory of change may work eventually. Like we might eventually get a good ruling out of it, but it's taking its sweet damn time. So what else can we do? Well, we could try the activism route, and we did. Uh, we flew a blimp over the NSA data center in Utah with the help of Greenpeace, uh, pointing out that there was illegal spying going on in said data center. Uh, this was fun. It drew a lot of media attention. It raised a lot of awareness. Of course, it didn't get the NSA to be like, oh, you're right, we're sorry, let's stop doing that. Uh, they didn't do that. They're still uh, performing warrantless surveillance, as far as we know. Um, so, of course, then that brings us to that last theory of change. What about technology? So what, if we think about it, what enables this mass surveillance? Well, it's the fact that what the NSA is getting, and this is an example from uh, X key score, uh, is plain text. How are they getting plain text? Well, if you think about it 10 years ago, the reason they're getting plain text is because there was almost no HTTPS support. Like, think about it, 10 years ago, there was basically no encryption on the web. Your credit card data was probably encrypted, maybe, and that was it. Like, logins to major websites. And I'm, I've got, you know, Google, Wikipedia, Facebook, uh, Twitter up here. I'm not picking on them in particular. They're just exemplars. The entire web was basically not encrypted. Um, so if you're from any of these companies, if you're from Wikipedia or Wikimedia, uh, I'm not picking on you in particular, to be clear. Like, this was, this was an ecosystem-wide problem. But no HTTPS support allowing the NSA to scoop up all of the plain text, that sounds like a technology problem. I, we're technologists, maybe we can solve this. And so that's what we tried to do. Uh, we launched a browser extension. So we said, well, what's the easiest way to do it? Let's get people using HTTPS. The websites aren't supporting it by default. Well, let's make a browser extension called HTTPS Everywhere which will switch to HTTPS when a website supports it. And so that's what we did. We worked with, uh, with uh, Tor Project to launch this browser. Uh, it launched in June of 2010. It came out of beta, I think, about a year later, maybe August uh, of 2011. Um, might have been just a little later. And it automatically upgrades connections to a list of websites uh, that we know support HTTPS, but maybe don't use it by default. Uh, and when we launched, it was about a thousand websites. It's now tens of thousands of websites. Um, and again, this is a, this is a uh, hand curated list. Uh, the other neat thing about HPS Everywhere, uh, it didn't do this when it, when it launched, but we eventually did integrate mixed content blocking before the browsers actually started doing mixed content blocking. So, it, so mixed content blocking is when an HPS website loads a resource or an HPS page loads a resource over HTTP. And so that, that is a way that an attacker could sneak in some malicious JavaScript or something to exfiltrate uh, some data that's on the page. And so we blocked that before the browsers started doing it by default, which I think is pretty cool. So we've got this browser extension. People can now encrypt their connections. And the NSA can't decrypt everyone's connections. They may be able to do targeted decryption. And if they've got, you know, uh, if, if law enforcement has a warrant and a reason to decrypt someone's connections, like, fine, you know, that's not something we're going to argue about. It's the mass surveillance that we have the problem with. So great, we can, we've solved it, right? Everything's, uh, well, actually, let me step back a second. It's, it's also kind of the timing was fortuitous of when we launched it. Uh, because a few months later, a guy uh, by the last name Butler released FireSheep. Uh, who here knows what FireSheep is? Some of you might be, so not everyone, so some of you might be a little, actually a little young for FireSheep, because again, this was nine years ago. Uh, FireSheep was a browser extension for Firefox that sniffed Wi-Fi packets uh, on whatever Wi-Fi, unsecure Wi-Fi network you're using at your local cafe, Starbucks, library, what have you. Um, and it would look for the session cookie that Facebook was using to authenticate you as a Facebook user. So when you logged into Facebook at the time, I mean, obviously since then, you know, it's 10 years later, Facebook has done the right thing. But at the time, your password would be sent over HTTPS, but then Facebook would send you back a cookie, basically a token that you would use to authenticate with every connection that say, you know, I'm, Jer I'm whatever, I'm Jeremy Gula, this Facebook user, and Facebook would say, okay, great. That cookie was always sent in the clear, which meant that anyone who could get a hold of that cookie could also pretend to be you, and that's exactly what FireSheep did. It made it trivially easy for anyone to install the extension uh, and then basically hijack people's uh, Facebook sessions on the same Wi-Fi network. And the cool thing, of course, is that HBS Everywhere 
totally, you know, protects against fire sheep. Um, and so this was a great example for us of why this was useful. So great, we've got this tool, it actually works, wonderful, uh, everything is awesome, we're done, right? Yeah, th this would be a much shorter talk, we're not even close to done. Uh, everything, in fact, is not awesome. Uh, so let's fast forward now, uh, two years later. No, so, so now this is about 2011, uh, fire, our HTTPS everywhere is out of beta. There's still almost no default HTTPS support. So now we've got a lot of uh, major websites support HTTPS, but maybe not by default. You know, maybe Google has made it by this point uh, in 2011, Gmail, all the traffic is default, but search isn't necessarily. Um, uh, Wikipedia, uh, I think some log logins may be over HTTPS, but maybe that's it. And so we still got a problem here. So EFF said, okay, look, just giving a tool to smart users or informed users or, or users who have relatives who are informed and told them install HTTPS everywhere on your browser just because I told you to and I'm the, you know, tech support in this house, uh, that's not enough because most of the world isn't using HTTPS everywhere. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch a campaign and we called it HTTPS Now. It was launched uh, jointly with uh, Access Now, another nonprofit, um, and essentially it was two parts. One was encouraging users to install HTTPS everywhere, but the other part was starting to throw shade on the companies for not supporting HTTPS by default. And basically saying, look, you need to up your security game uh, and start using HTTPS. Uh, and so we made a little progress, you know, talking uh, smack about the companies or not, we, that wasn't even targeting specific companies, that was just sort of encouraging companies to adopt HTTPS, made some progress. Uh, and so now, seven years ago, this is what, like 2012, uh, Twitter, Google are now using uh, HTTPS by default, but again, there are still some major websites that aren't using it across their services. Um, so, now nah, we're making some slow progress, fine, maybe eventually we'll get to an encrypted web, it'll be a slow, but, you know, it'll happen eventually. And then this guy showed up on the scene. Uh, and he told us a bunch of things that mostly EFF already knew, because of that whistleblower Mark Klein from uh, about seven years earlier, but it sort of reawakened the public that the NSA was basically watching nearly everything you do online. Uh, and in particular, they were able to gather up tons and tons of clear text. So this also came as a kick in the complacency for us at EFF that there, we had to do more. Like what we were doing was not good enough. We definitely had to do more. And so essentially what we decided to do was uh, take it in two parts. The first part was we decided to actually start rating specific companies on how they were supporting encryption. Uh, so we, uh, in uh, 2013, we released something called the Encrypting the Web Report. We ranked a lot of companies uh, on basic things like, are their data center links encrypted? Do they support HTTPS in the first place? Uh, are they using strict transport security? So that's when, uh, for those of you that don't know, it's when you uh, connect to a website, it sends back a header that says, from now on, whenever you connect to me, use HTTPS. If you, if, if, you try, if I try to tell you use HTTP in the future, that's a lie, someone is attacking your connection. Uh, we rank them on using forward secrecy. Uh, we rank them on their start TLS support. Uh, fun uh, anachronistic fact, uh, some of these companies, not so relevant anymore, uh, meh, you know, uh, but we made some progress. And you can see that by putting this thing out, and this is actually, I think, the final version of it, there were several companies that actually worked hard to get check marks across the board. So we were definitely making some progress here. But I think you're getting the idea. Everything is not quite awesome yet. Uh, because although these major companies represent a large percentage of internet traffic, there is a long tail of websites that people visit. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and if you look sort of at the beginning of 2014, the web still wasn't encrypted despite getting these companies to start supporting HTTPS. Uh, this is uh, telemetry from Firefox. The percentage of page loads at the time worldwide was about 30% back in uh, early 2014 or late 2013. And so we said to ourselves, okay, look, we've done all we can to pressure the big guys. What can we do for the rest of the web? And what is the problem? Like, why isn't why isn't, you know, some random website somebody stands up encrypted? And the answer was, there were a couple of reasons. 
First, I mean, so the, the problem was TLS wasn't ubiquitous. This is uh, Quora in, I think, 2014, um, sending, I don't know if you can read it, but sending passwords in the clear, pretty much. Uh, and also, uh, I should mention credit to Yan Zhu for the, for the next couple of slides. She was a staff technologist at EFF for a while. She's now CISO at Brave. So thank you, Yan, if you're watching this. Your slides are very helpful. Uh, made it less work for me. Uh, but even Google in like 2015 would have a sign, a link to a sign in page that is not encrypted. And so an attacker, you know, this isn't the sign in page itself, but an attacker could man in the middle of this redirect that sign in button to wherever the heck they wanted, some phishing site, and steal your credentials. And if Google can't get this right, like how can we expect the average person who is not even a security professional, like you in the room, to figure out how to do this right? So what were the reasons for this? Well, one, setting up TLS was tedious. I look at, this is instructions from DreamHost, again, I think circa like 2015, um, on how to set up a certificate on your, HP, on your website so it would be HPS. And I look at this and my eyes glaze over. I just sort of start falling asleep because this is going to just, ugh, so much boring manual labor. It's also really, really hard knowing what cipher suites to enable, keeping up on the latest, like what is going on, what are the latest vulnerabilities in TLS. Uh, I mean, people wrote, write entire books about this stuff. They're like there's no way if people are writing entire books about this stuff, they we can expect like average mom and pop shop to figure out how to set up TLS themselves. And the alternative is they have to pay someone a ton of money to do it. And it takes that person, I mean at the time, we tested with quite a few sysadmins, and it would take, you know, even a, a skilled, experienced sysadmin an hour or two to properly set up TLS on a website. And that's just, that's if you, like, know how to do it by rote. So that's just, that's not reasonable. So, the web wasn't encrypted. TLS was really hard to do. This made us all sad pandas at EFF. We literally grew fur and black, no, never mind. Uh, also, one point I didn't mention, it costs money at the time, for the most part. There were a couple of free certificate authorities, but most certificate authorities cost money. Uh, and so it's a lot of work, it's hard, like why would you bother doing it? Especially if a lot of the times people would say, well, we're not sending sensitive content. Uh, and our answer to that was, that's great, but that's still not an excuse. Like, all content is sensitive in one way or another to somebody. So. What if I told you we can fix that? Like, how are we going to fix all of TLS or all of getting TLS out into the world? Well, the answer was we decided to set up a free certificate authority. So uh, this was a partnership. Again, credit where credit is due. This was not all EFF. This was EFF working with the University of Michigan, Alex Halderman's lab, uh, as well as uh, Mozilla. So the, the three groups partnered together to set up a free certificate authority called Let's Encrypt. Also. Uh, Mea culpa, you can see how old these slides are, because that says arriving Q4 2015. Yeah, it is now Q1 2019, and I can assure you, as you will see in the rest of the slides, uh, Let's Encrypt is launched and arrived and has been kicking butt. Um, but the goal was, let's eliminate the obstacles to getting a certificate and setting it up properly. So, uh, going back to those problems, TLS is not ubiquitous. It required a lot of manual labor. Uh, it also required, it wasn't just like computer manual labor. A lot of the time it was interacting with another person, which is silly because this is a computer thing that we should be able to automate. So our solution was let's actually make a protocol for getting a certificate that you can, that you can use to get the certificate and install it on your, on your server. So the protocol is called ACME that we came up with. It stands for Automated Certificate Management Something I don't remember, but it's not important. Uh, and it works like follows. So, say you have your web server and you want to get a certificate. So that's called an Acme client. It's confusing because it's your server, but we call it a client. That's just what the way it is. Yay for confusing terminology. And then you've got some Acme server, which is the certificate authority that is actually going to issue you the certificate, that's going to sign your certificate. So. You talk to them, say, hey, CA, I want a certificate for example.com. Say that's what I'm trying to host. Uh, and here's the public key I want to use on my certificate. Great. The, C the Acme server then responds and says, okay, here's this nonce. Here's this random string of text and numbers and letters. 
uh, I want you to post it in this particular place on your web server and also sign it with the corresponding private key. Uh, so this, the, the reason for this is twofold. One, by posting it somewhere on your server, on a particular place on your server, you're showing that you, you're, you have control to make this server serve arbitrary content, right? So only the person who control, or only the entity that controls this server has that ability. Uh, the other thing is by signing it with your private key, you can guarantee that you actually have the private key that corresponds to the public key that you were telling the certificate authority about. So these are really the two parts that are necessary to prove that you own or that you control this domain. So you get this nonce, you go through, you say, great, I posted it. And then the Acme server says, great, let me fetch it and see if you really did post it. And then they fetch it, it's just a normal HTTP request. It comes back, you know, over normal HTTP channels, says here's that nonce and signature, you, you submitted an HTTP GET request. The, C, the Acme server then says, okay, let me look, is that the nonce, I, first, is that the nonce I actually told you to post? Uh, make sure it's not something else. And second, is the signature valid? Does it, does it match up with the public key you sent me before? Uh, and if it does, the signature, signature checks out, it gives you your certificate, bam. And all of this is in an automated protocol. So you don't have to like create a certificate signing request or like call someone up at the CA and say, yes, it's really me, I really do control example.com, can you give me uh, that cert that I asked for? You don't have to do any of that. And of course, to make that protocol automated, we had to create a client. So we created, we, the idea is we want to create a client that will do all of this for the user, uh, that basically gets it right, does a simple command line interface, but also addressing the, you know, TLS is hard and tedious to set up part, uh, we want to have the client do some things automatically. So first, if you're already running a web server, we want it to automatically tweak the web server so you can pass the challenge. So for example, if you're already hosting something on port 80, like we don't want to mess with your existing web server while you're trying to get your cert. So we'll figure out how to set up the subdomain and do everything right and configure Apache uh, so that it will do this all automatically for you to pass that challenge and response uh, setup that I just talked about. Um, it will also install the resulting cert. It'll, it knows where to put it and how to configure Apache and Nginx so that if you, so that you don't even have to be a, a web server expert, a sysadmin expert, you can just tell it, install the cert, Some, somebody told me that, you know, use certbot. Uh, it'll also tweak the security configuration uh, for good results so that you can, you know, go to SSL labs to get an A or an A plus. Uh, it'll use the right cipher suites. It'll disable TLS 1.0 by default uh, because unless the only clients connecting to you are Windows XP clients, you probably shouldn't be running TLS 1.0. Uh, it'll do all these things for you. And the, the, probably the most important part is it will automate renewal because certificates expire, right? And in particular, the way Let's Encrypt is set up, certificates expire after 90 days because if there is, because this is an automated process, if something goes wrong, we want to have a very short certificate lifetime so we're not stuck 10 years later with certificates that were misissued uh, that have some sort of problem with them. We want it to be a very short lifetime. And so that means we need automated renewal because we can't expect a person to remember to do this every 90 days. Uh, of course, this links to current events. Wait, oh no. Yeah, I'll skip to current events first and then I'll come back. Current events. Uh, the government shutdown has caused, apparently, at least according to news reports, at least 80 different government servers to have their TLS certificates expire. That's kind of ridiculous. This should be something that should be automated. A solution. The government could use CertBot and automate renewal. I mean, obviously, a, a second solution would be maybe don't shut down the government over a stupid wall. Uh, but, but I digress, this is not a political talk. Uh, I'm really not gonna take political stances on anything, so I'm, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, let's, let's, let's move back to the automation. So, where were we? What kinds of automation? So, the easy ones, cipher tuning, using the right cipher suites, uh, disabling, you know, very weak or broken cipher suites, uh, doing OCSP stapling. That's already done, that's in CertBot, great. We can do that. There's some slightly harder stuff, uh, there's some stuff about doing, you know, HTTP to HTTPS redirects, uh, maybe doing uh, the automatic renewal, CertBot does that, rekeying. You don't want to be using the same key material over and over and over, so every time you renew your certificate, it will automatically use a new uh, public and private key, unless you tell it not to, if for some reason you don't want to, that's an option. Uh, I wouldn't do that, but 
you know, maybe you've got a good reason. There's some slightly harder stuff, uh, like doing full HTTP to HTTPS rewrites. Um, uh, another one is setting up HSTS, HTTP strict transport security, so that you don't bork your site in the process. Because, as I mentioned before, HSTS makes it so that anyone who comes back to your website only trusts it over HTTPS. And so if you screw something up and have to uh, revert back to HTTP, all those clients are gonna say, no way, no, no how, I am not connecting to you anymore. Um, and so we actually have that implemented now. It will slowly lengthen the lifetime of your HSTS header so that it, it'll first start with a very short expiration date so that if something messes up, it's only a day or two or you know, an hour or two that clients can't connect. And then as things are working, it will gradually lengthen that lifetime. And then there's some hard stuff which we haven't tackled yet that is sort of far in the future. Uh, stuff like doing mixed content auditing on a actual web server uh, and correcting it. Uh, or doing, uh, I don't I think we're not even gonna bother doing HPKP. So, we have the client that does this. It's called Certbot. We actually, this is a piece of software that you can app get install. Uh, it automatically fetches and renews certificates. It automatically configures Apache and Nginx if you want it. If you don't, it doesn't have to do that. You can just get the certificate. There is a standalone mode. It's literally dash dash standalone, which just gets the certificate for you. And then you can do whatever the heck you want with it. Um, it supports plugins. So uh, it supports hooks. So if you want to run a certain script every time you get a certificate renewed, like write that script, hook it in, and it'll run every time the certificate gets renewed. Uh, and it works on most Unix-based systems. Uh, so Great, wonderful, like, we've got this. You could do it, you can get it now. Like, this has been up for a while. Uh, yeah, we already talked about current events. We'll skip the, that, how this isn't a political talk. Uh, so, a little too far. So, we launched Let's Encrypt, we launched CertBot. This was about four years ago. Uh, and great, HBS for everybody. And to be perfectly honest, in my opinion, we kicked butt. This is a graph of uh, the certificates issued by Let's Encrypt. Uh, so, again, to be clear, Let's Encrypt sort of spun off as its own nonprofit after Mozilla and EFF and University of Michigan got started. It's now supported by a variety of other different companies as well. Um, as, again, as an aside, sorry for the rambling, uh, if you work at a major company, you should seriously suggest that that major company consider donating and supporting Let's Encrypt. Because without Let's Encrypt, the long tail of the web stops being encrypted. Uh, and so if you support security, consider encouraging your company to make a charitable donation to Let's Encrypt. I'm not even begging for EFF money at the moment, just Let's Encrypt. Anyway, so we've got what? I don't know if you can read the numbers on those, it might be too small, but we've got 140 million FQDNs uh, that we've issued certificates for, uh, something like 90 million uh, active certificates, something like what, 60, or no, sorry, 40 million registered domains active. Um, we've we really, I mean, I think it is safe to say that the existence of Let's Encrypt has made a huge dent in whether or not the long tail of the web gets encrypted. And I can say that because we can look at this graph and see that now, in the beginning of 2019, we are at, what, like 80%, uh, or sorry, 75% uh, of page loads being encrypted, whereas five years ago, we were at less than half that. So we have made a huge frickin' difference. Now, to be clear, there were other things that were involved. Uh, I mean, this trend was always gonna sort of gradually, slowly go up. There were other, th other parts of the ecosystem that changed. Google deciding to rank pages on whether or not they are encrypted made a difference for sure. That kicked people's complacency. But without Let's Encrypt, a lot of them would have said, crap, now that just means our search rankings go down instead of, because we, we, we can't afford to get a certificate or we don't know how to do it. Whereas with Let's Encrypt, they can just go get the cert. Um, so I actually wanna pause for a second and say that if any of you in the room, because I know there are a lot of amazing security professionals in the room, had a part in changing the ecosystem to do this, give yourself a pat on the back. Because a lot, the, again, this wasn't just EFF. A lot of people worked very hard to make sure that the, I mean, think about it. The communications infrastructure of humanity in basically 10 years went from not encrypted to almost entirely encrypted. That is a huge undertaking. That is huge. And the future looks bright. Uh, HTTPS 2, so the next version of HTTP. Uh, if you're going to use it with a major browser, it's gonna be encrypted. Uh, just by default, that's what it will be. There will not be a unencrypted option. So in terms of getting encryption widely, widely spread on the web, things are looking pretty good. 
we are, we are pretty optimistic. But we're also not satisfied. The web is not the entirety of the internet. Uh, and in particular, we want to expand from just the web to all of the internet to really get as much of the world encrypted as we can. And there are three things uh, that I'm going to spend the rest of the talk talking about uh, that are sort of our next major focuses for promoting encryption. Uh, TLS SNI, encrypted DNS, uh, and then start TLS, which is uh, email. So let's, let's start with the first one. So TLS SNI, is anyone in the room from Cloudflare? Or willing to admit they're from, nobody? Or, no, or nobody's willing to admit it. Well, I stole this diagram straight from Cloudflare. I mean, I, bar I public fair used this diagram straight from Cloudflare. So credit to Cloudflare's design team for making an awesome diagram um, that describes how SNI works. So SNI, when my browser on my computer wants to talk to, say, example.com, uh, example.com, there might be many domains hosted uh, at that same IP address. And so I have to tell it, which, do, which domain am I going to? Because, for example, Cloudflare is a CDN, or a content distribution network, and they might be hosting many domains at the same IP address. So I have to tell them which one I'm trying to connect to. And in particular, I do that with a field in the TLS spec called server name indication. And that field is sent in the clear. It's sent in plain text. Uh, and so a malicious attacker who is monitoring my communications, even though after it gets encrypted, all my communications, what page I'm viewing, the content of the page is all encrypted, can still see what domain I'm viewing. Uh, and this might be enough to tell someone that I am a dissident, because I'm going to a dissident website if I am in a, you know, a uh, non-democratic regime. Uh, it could be enough to, you know, if, if I'm in a censorship-prone area. Uh, uh, as might happen, a ISP might want to censor the, uh, the website of a certain union. Uh, this happened in Canada, uh, where a, I, I forget which ISP, but basically they were in uh, labor talks with the union and decided to block access to that union's website. Um, and so they could have done that using, by looking at the SNI field. So this is a problem. Um, I'm not sure why this hacker is wearing a hoodie, why hackers are always wearing hoodies. Uh, actually, wait, no, that's not true. I switched the hoodie, I switched my hoodie for this sport coat just to give the talk, and I've been wearing my hoodie for the past two days, so never mind. Oh, bed hair. I, unfortunately, I would gladly uh, take the bed hair problem, but unfortunately, <sighs> oh well. Anyway, so in, the way encrypted SNI works is it encrypts that field. Well, what do you encrypt it with? You have to get the key from somewhere, and the answer is you get the key from, you put the key in DNS. So example.com or the whatever service is hosting example.com will put a key in the DNS records for example.com that says, by the way, when you're connecting to me, or when you connect to example.com, here's the public key that you should use to encrypt the SNI field. And you should still tell me which domain you're trying to connect to, but you encrypt it with this, send it, send it on its way, and that way anyone who is looking at your communication between your browser and example.com, all they're gonna see is this encrypted SNI. They won't be able to get it. Now, uh, there's a pretty big uh, flaw in this, which is why it's sort of been a chicken and the egg problem, which is, uh, the attacker can still look at the DNS re requests that you're making, right? Like, that's a problem. That's still not encrypted. So, uh, that brings us to, let's encrypt the DNS then, right? We'll just keep encrypting all the way up. It's like turtles, except all the way up. Uh, so, there are two competing uh, specs for encrypting DNS at the moment, two competing proposals. One is encrypted uh, DNS over HTTPS, and one is DNS over SNI, uh, or sorry, over SNI, over TLS. Wow, you get about 35 minutes into a talk and acronyms just start to blend together. So DNS over HTTP, HTTPS is precisely what it sounds like. It is you connect over port 443 to the DNS server and make a request, some DNS request, and it sends it back. It just happens over HTTPS. The pros with that, the good side of that, is that it makes it very hard to censor. Um, because if I am a censorship-prone regime and I don't want you using encrypted DNS, I then have to block all the encrypted traffic. And as the world is moving to, you know, 75% of traffic is encrypted, 
uh, I don't think I'm going to block 75% of traffic. Or as we move to HTTP2, literally all of the web, because uh, that would bring my economy down to a crashing standstill. So that's a problem, uh, and that, or it's a problem for the regime that wants to censor encrypted DNS. The downside is it also makes it harder for network operators to monitor for malicious activity uh, and to basically protect users at the network level. The flip side, DNS over TLS, again, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's just a mirror. It just happens over its, its DNS over TLS. It has its own uh, assigned port. And so because of the way DNS over TLS is designed, it makes it a lot easier for network operators to basically protect users to watch for malicious activity but the downside is that a censorship prone regime or a ISP that wants all your DNS traffic to be in the clear uh, because they want you using their DNS instead of someone else's DNS, anything like that, can tell when you're using DNS over TLS and block it. And so that's a problem. Um, EFF has not really come to a conclusion yet about which of these we think is the right answer. Uh, if you have opinions, if you have strong opinions, please come tell me after the talk. I would love to hear them. I am not going to promise that you'll convince me. Uh, I will, I promise to listen. Uh, I don't know which way we're going to end up. We might end up saying, just support one of them and leave it to the operating system, the user to decide. But it's clear we need some sort of solution for encrypting DNS. So if you have strong feelings, again, you're the security experts in the room, please help guide EFF and tell us what you think the right thing to do is. We would love your opinions. So how are we actually going to get uh, TLS, SNI, and encrypted DNS? Well, the answer is we're going to shame the companies again. Uh, before too long, no, uh, no guarantee on when, we are almost certainly going to do another encrypting the, uh, sorry, not the web, the net report. And these two things are going to be on it. So if you are a major ISP, if you are a browser, or, or a browser developer, if you are a major internet company, uh, we are probably going to be reaching out to you before too long to tell you that we are going to evaluate your uh, modern crypto and see how well your, how good your support is, uh, and then we're going to publish something about it. So if you are a security engineer at one of these aforementioned organizations, and you've been trying to push them to say, hey, look, we really got to start supporting encrypted SNI, uh, but your boss has been like, man, nobody cares about that. It's not a big deal. This is your excuse to go to them and say, actually, EFF is going to start shaming us about it, so maybe we should do this. Uh, because we're going to start shaming you about it, so maybe you should do it. Um, again, no promises at the moment on launch dates. Uh, this could be a month, this could be a year. We will talk to the companies before it happens. We always make sure to do that. But it's coming, because there is more to encrypting the net. Than, and our last report was, is like five years old now. So time for another one. All right. The last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll finish up, is email. Uh, email is the cockroach, as, as everyone knows, the cockroach of the internet. When our great-great-grandchildren are all dead, when the singularity has come, the hive mind will communicate with itself via email, because email will not die. Uh, and in particular, email is also not that encrypted at the moment. So if you're, I mean, everyone know, in, in this room, I'm sure, knows how email works. You connect to, you have some client that connects to some mail transfer agent software, that software, that MTA talks with another MTA, et cetera. The link between your client and the MTA is probably encrypted. If you, you're on webmail, it's over HTTPS. If you're using uh, an IMAP client, it's probably over some sort of TLS. But it's this one, this link between MTAs, that may or may not be encrypted. Um, and in particular, the, the protocol for encrypting it is called Start TLS, for those people in the room who aren't email experts. And StartTLS is trivially uh, susceptible to downgrade attacks. So if there's an attacker be sitting between, say, EFF's mail server and Google's mail server, and EFF says, hey, Google, let's start a TLS connection. I got some mail to send you. The attacker can literally just strip out the StartTLS response. It's sent in the clear. They can just strip it out and say, nah, Google. They're basically, it makes it look like Google is saying they don't support StartTLS. They don't support an encrypted connection. Because the way StartTLS is written, or StartTLS is, is written, it can just be stripped out trivially. So that's a problem. StartTLS will prevent passive attacks, so passive monitoring. It won't help with active attacks. Even scarier is most MTA software these days is not validating certificates. Because 
well, I'll get into that in a minute. But suffice it to say that most MTS software isn't checking, is the cert that Google sent me back for this TLS connection actually valid? Does it belong to Google? Does it chain up to a trusted root? Um, and so an attacker in the middle can just sign their own certificate, stand in the middle and say, yes, you've got an encrypted connection with, I'm Google and you've got an encrypted connection with me. Uh, and then it turns out it's actually not. And so you think you're talking with Google, it looks all good, it looks encrypted, but because you're not checking the certificate, your MTA software isn't checking the certificate, it's no good. And this is not theoretical. Uh, is, this survey is a little old. Uh, it was done in 2015. It's about four years old. If anyone uh, in the room wants to do a more up-to-date survey, EFF will then crow about the results from the mountaintops. Uh, we don't have the person power and the time and the money to do, do this survey ourselves, but if someone else wants to do a survey, uh, please do. Um, but at least five, uh, four years ago, like 40% of the Alexa top million domains we're providing invalid certificates for start TLS connections. These might have been self-signed, they might have been expired, they might have just been for like the wrong domain, um, but that's kind of crazy. Uh, and then in some countries, like start TLS, the start TLS header is being stripped out at ridiculous rates, like 96% in Tunisia. That's kind of scary uh, if you're trying to send an email to someone whose MTA software is in Tunisia. Also, 4% in Denmark? Like, what is going on in Denmark? I wasn't aware Denmark was an anti-democratic uh, regime. I don't know if there are any Danes in the audience who want to correct me on my politics or my uh, geopolitical understanding, but weird. So, trivial downgrade attacks, uh, trivial impersonation attacks. What's the solution? It's something called MTA-STS. This is like HSTS, but it's for mail transfer agents. It's mail transfer agent strict transport security. It works something like this. So this is a spec, again, that was just finalized last year. So we've got two mail servers. EFF mail wants to send mail to Google. So first, it goes to the DNS, it's whatever DNS provider, and says, hey, DNS provider, is there an MTSTS text record for Google.com, or for Gmail.com, rather? And the DNS provider says, yeah, sure, here it is. And that's because Google put it in its DNS record. Then, now the EFF mail client knows that Google supports MTASTS. So then they go to a specific domain that Google has set up, mtasts.gmail.com, and they say, hey, can you give me the MTASTS policy? So the policy defines things like when it, it has an expiration date, um, it's uh, like what mail servers should uh, correspond to which certificates, um, what version of MTASTS it's using, uh, where to send failure reports, that sort of thing. So it gets sent back, here's the policy. And so finally then EFF mail can do the start TLS connection, know that Google is going to support the start TLS connection, will have a valid certificate uh, and go from there. Great, so this is, a, this is uh, ITF spec. Um, I forget what RFC number it is. Uh, and of course if, if there's an attacker in the middle, now we get to this connection where say we've done all of that, but the connection comes back and for some reason, Google does not support MTASTS. Then, in that policy, as I said, there's a place where that is that basically Google has said, hey, if there's a problem, send a report here. And so EFF can send a, it's called a TLS report uh, on what went wrong or what happened. Um, and in particular, an important part of this is that this, this doesn't just apply if there's, a miscon if there's an attacker. It can also apply if there's a misconfiguration, like Google messed something up or forgot to renew its certificate or whatever, then they can easily get through an out-of-band channel a report saying, look, mail isn't, getting being, be, isn't being delivered to you, you need to fix it. And then they can quickly go ahead and fix it and then mail will continue to be delivered. So how do we get uh, MTA STS actually out into the wild? Uh, the answer is we started a project called Start TLS Everywhere, which has three goals. One is MTA STS adoption. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about now. So first, uh, obviously, we need mail servers to support Start TLS. The good news is all the, mail ma all, all the major mail servers already do. All right, so that's, that's easy. I mean, it's sort of like a step zero that's kind of obvious. The next step is we also need the mail servers to get certificates because they have to present valid certificates. Then, as I mentioned, we need to make it easy for sysadmins to receive failure reports, because no sysadmin in their right mind is going to set this thing up if it's gonna impact mail deliverability, because then they'll get fired. 
no matter how much, how much better the security is, and people don't like being fired. So we need to make sure there's an easy, quick correction mechanism. Then we need to make it easy for sysadmins to actually post-correct MTA uh, STS DNS records and, and their policy files. And last, and probably the hardest, is we need to make sure MTA software actually knows how to do MTA STS, knows how to get the policies, how to use them, how to respond if something goes wrong. So let's quickly go through each of these in turn. So, uh, as I said, we can skip step one, go straight to step two about getting mail servers a certificate. The answer is, you can use CertBot for this. So we're done. We have guides posted on not only how to get the certificate, but then uh, configure your mail server for Dovecot, XSIM, Postfix, SendMail. If there's anyone in this audience who runs a mail server, and you are still using a self-signed certificate in the next three minutes of this talk, shame on you. It's easy. Go fix it. All right, done. Get your mail server a damn certificate. Two, receiving failure reports. So as I mentioned, there is a TLS report spec uh, put together by the same people who put the, together the MTA STS spec. And one of the things it defines as a way to receive these failure reports is over email. And everyone has an email address. So it is easy for you to make sure that you are getting, at least receiving, these failure reports. What you do with them afterwards is up to you, how you write scripts to parse them and whatever. But at least the receiving part, that's easy, that's done. We know how to send emails, just not necessarily encrypted. Uh, posting MTA STS records and policies. So we have a website as part of this project called starttlseverywhere.org. Uh, one of the things it currently does is it checks and sees if your website supports Start TLS, uh, also if it has a valid cert. And what we're working on is making it so that mail server admins can enter their, uh, their whatever domain name they want for their mail server, answer a few questions, click a few check boxes, and it will automatically generate uh, a MTA STS DNS record and policy file for you. You have to then go post it and we'll tell you exactly where to post it and what to do with it, but what we've heard from mail server admins, and if you, you think differently, come talk to me after the talk, uh, they've told us don't mess with our configs, don't write some automated thing, just give us the files, we'll put them in the right place. So that's what we're doing. So this is in progress. Uh, the other thing it'll do is after you post it, you can hit another button and check and make sure that you did it right. We'll go and check and we'll see, you know, we'll try to make the connections that everything go correctly. This is in progress. Uh, again, don't ask for launch dates. It's, we're working on it, but it's a thing we're doing. The last part is getting MTA software to actually use MTA STS. Right now, as far as I know, no MTA software actually supports MTA STS, because this is a literally, like, last year, less than one year old brand new spec. So we see two options here. One, we could submit patches for MTAs. Uh, for major MTAs. Uh, the downside to that is that, well, there's two downsides. One, it's a lot of work for EFF. Um, some of the MTAs have roadmaps where they're gonna do it themselves, and that's awesome. Uh, it might take them a year, but okay. Uh, one downside, though, is that mail server admins upgrade their mail servers about once a lifetime. Uh, about as often as you change your corporeal existence on this planet. Uh, and so that's not gonna happen very frequently, and so it will take forever for this to get rolled out, if that's what we do. Uh, I mean, I guess we could start a upgrade your MTA campaign. Um, I don't know how well it would work. The other option is we could write some sort of middleware application or middleware box that sits in front of your MTA that just handles MTA STS for you. Now the problem with that is it adds more complexity of one sort uh, in terms of, you know, getting your mail delivered. It, it reduces complexity in terms of then we have maybe just one sort of implementation that handles MTA STS. Um, but it's also one more thing to administer, and that's, you know, system bins are always touchy about one more thing to administer. So, if you have, maybe there's another option. If you have thoughts, this is still very much in the planning stages. You have ideas, suggestions, please come talk to us. This is where we could really use the, the mail server uh, admin community and the security community's input. So, we have our work cut out for us, uh, as you can see, but we think the future looks bright. Uh, and, whoops, and uh, you know, we've come a long way in 10 years, and in particular, it's been a lot of people's hard work. To be very clear, I personally have done almost none of this work. Uh, it has been the work of dozens of people. Uh, these are the names that I could come up with that I know worked at or contracted with, got paid by EFF, but we've also had tons of open source contributors, uh, especially on HBS Everywhere, the open source contributors are amazing. Um, and of course, other folks, the security community at large has also been working on this. 
the last thing I want to say, uh, and then I swear I'll wrap up because they're about to pull me off the stage, is that for those who don't know, EFF is a nonprofit. We are supported by members. You know, your donations directly tr translate into this sort of software. Uh, and we're not a big team either. We have maybe like eight software developers that are doing all of this work. Uh, and in particular, I want to zoom in on this part here. Uh, I'm not an accountant, so I don't, this legend on the right doesn't make sense to me, so I decided to make my own legend. The vast majority of EFF's support comes from individual donations. That is all the sort of reddish stuff there. Uh, there's also portions that are sheer luck. This is when a court decides to randomly give EFF money for a class action. So it's a class action lawsuit we're not even involved in, but the court says, man, instead of giving everybody 75 cents because there was a data breach, let's give it to EFF or ACLU or Epic uh, or something like that. So, uh, and of course, uh, Shmukan has been a great supporter. So thank you very much. <laughs>